influence on each other. So <laughs> with the same propositions and everything. John Jackson versus John is John Jackson Well, flakes are flakes, right? Whether it's post or uh, what is the other name? Kellogg's. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Flakes are flakes. Regardless of the brand. Oh, that's not the right one. Alright, let me start up the right browser with the back. You guys cannot see anything. Happens every single time. Okay, where's my profile manager? Where did it go? Where did it go? All right. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So, are there any questions about the homework assignment? Nope. Okay. Are you recording? Um, I think so. I'll double check after I sign in here. Homework assignment is the uh, music box, right? Yep. Music box is the only outstanding homework assignment. How was it? Oh, Fun. I uh, redid it afterwards. Okay. Using the uh, adder we created mm -hmm. and attached that to it instead of the adder that oh. uh, Chip gave us. Okay. <laughs> nice. Okay. That's so nice. Sorry? I built a 12-hour Oh, so that was you. Okay, good job. Shane did a 24-hour. I see. That takes a lot of work. I wonder why we are stuck with these kind of odd kind of base, like 16 minutes in an hour and then 24 yeah. hours in a day, that sort of thing. 365 days in a year, I can kind of explain that one. Yeah, that one is easy because one is the rotation of the Earth. The other one is the rotation of the Earth around the sun. So they're irrational numbers, and it's just... Yeah. Just canceled it be the way it is. The biggest challenge with it was trying to get it to reset once it hits 1259. <laughs> yeah. You can make a really gigantic uh, ROM table. <laughs> I used a lot of different ROMs for it. You can use different ROMs because you know, but each ROM is nothing more than you know just an array and you're indexing it. Yeah. So you can index like you know, the first one is just the hour, and then you can have another one for minutes, and then one for the yeah, seconds. And then when they roll over, then you trigger the other one to increment by one. Yes. So, but good job. I mean, that's a that's a really interesting uh, kind of side trip, you know, to the to the homework assignment. Good job. All right. So today I can kind of go in do two different directions. I want to see which direction you guys would prefer to go. Okay. So we can make a hardware multiplier, or we can, well, we can start with different things. Okay, either a hardware multiplier, or um, you know the, the concept of a register bank, so that we can you know have multiple registers, and we can choose which register to supply information to feed to the adder or the subtractor, and then which one to store the result of the calculation. So which way do you guys want to go? Okay. We're doing both. Um, I'm just deciding which one to start with. Okay, so we're going to do both of them. Yeah. I hope so, yeah. Okay. So which one? Sorry, I tuned here. Register. Register? Okay, so we'll do register first, okay. So we'll do register bank, okay. <clears throat> and, um, and I'll be pretty much teaching this entire class out of um, Logisim because, you know, everything is in Logisim already. But we have a few components that I have to introduce that we haven't really talked about at this point. So, but I want to kind of talk about how things are hooked up first. So before we talk about an ALU, which is the arithmetic logical unit, I'm gonna talk about just using an adder, okay? So all I really want is to have a few registers so that I can specify which two registers will supply the values to add and which register will be storing the result of adding. Is that okay so far? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so the picture that we're going to draw is going to have at least this component, which is the adder, which is the thing that is doing the hard work. Okay, the adder has, you know, by this time, you know, I'm hoping that most of you know, you know, the ports of an adder. 
So the two ports to the left hand side, these two specify the numbers to be added. This is basically carry in, which is handy sometimes. But for this discussion, I'm not going to use it, which basically means I'm going to turn it into a zero. Go to wiring and use a constant of zero so that we don't have a carry of anything. So we have, whoops, you keep I keep changing it. Yep, there we go. All right, so we put a zero into carry in, and we're not going to use carry out, you know, just because, you know, for this discussion, it is not important. Later on, you know, carry in and carry out will have more significance, but at this time, it's not, okay? So we want to be able to add numbers and be able to store the values. Um, we have already kind of talked about memory cycles. In other words, we talked about how to access RAM, and there's a gazillion things you have to do before you can address you know, locations in RAM, and pretty much the same thing in ROM. And as a result, you know, we, we don't want to keep everything in RAM if we can avoid that. And registers, on the other hand, are very fast to access. In other words, when you look at a modern processor, the i5, i7 processors, registers can pretty much keep up with ALUs, okay? You know, the, um, the, the speed of calculation it basically matched the speed of storing and supplying values to the ALU when it comes to registers. So registers are basically, you know, the closest thing is even closer to that cache to the ALUs. Okay, are we okay with that? Okay, let's say this room is the physical analogy of a processor, okay, and I am the ALU, and the ALU is the one that is doing all the work, okay, doing all the calculations. So. Registers would be like pieces of paper that is right in front of me. Okay, so I can access all that stuff here you know, like immediately. There's no delay whatsoever to the ALU. Cache is kind of like you know someone in this room here keeping track of you know, what I need to use most in terms of frequency and just say that, oh, you, you just need that page of that book. I have a copy of that in you know, right next to me. So instead of going to the library, that person can say, okay, I have a local copy. Why don't you use the local copy? But it will still be further away from me because it will be like at the end of the classroom. That's basically kind of what cache is. It is still in the same room. It is a lot faster than going to the, going to the library, but it is not nearly as fast as registers, which is right next to me. I don't even need to walk to get to it. Is that okay? Kind of in, in terms of anal analogy. So we like registers, but then how come we cannot have like eight gigabytes of registers? Because ideally speaking, we like everything to be registers, but why can't we have eight, eight gigabytes of registers? Yep. Well, probably one would be your actual size of the process. You can only fit so much uh, transistors. transistors on the processor. Yep, that's right. Okay, so we can only fit so many transistors on the same die in, the, in terms of the processor. Because in addition to registers, we also have the ALU, we have all kinds of other stuff that we have to fit onto the same die. Uh, when you look at the i5, i7, you know, the uh, graphics processor is on it as well. Okay. It may not be the best, but in terms of cost effectiveness, it, is, it makes sense to include the video driver on the same die so that most computers do not need a video card anymore. You lower the cost to produce you know, computers by integrating all of these components onto the same die. Um, there are other reasons as well okay, why we have a limitation in terms of number of registers. Um, I'll just go ahead and see if I can find this um, first. Okay, so I want to look into the I386 or 86. Yep, go ahead. Why do we use cache? Because they serve different purposes. Um, cache can be used to cache instructions as well as data. Basically, cache is, is, um, is transparent as far as the processor is concerned. Cache is transparent. You know, I just have to say, you know, right here, I say, okay, someone can, someone give me page 29 of this particular textbook, okay? That's all, that's what, that's what the process is calling for, okay? So the memory, man memory management unit and the MMU, okay, is the one thing that is sitting at the end of the classroom to maintain, you know, the local cache. So if the local cache doesn't have that particular page, that person is gonna go out to the library, and actually, you know, get me the page from the library. On the other hand, you know, if that person figures out and call like tech, 
every single class you need to access this page like 20 times, why don't I just make a photocopy and have it local in the classroom so I don't have to go back and forth between the library and the classroom? The end of you will then put a cache that particular page. So every time they say, okay, page 29 of that textbook, that person will go like, okay, here it is. I don't have to run to the library anymore because I have a localized no cache copy of that. But registers are different. Registers are not um, transparent to the processor. Um, and th that's basically what I'm trying to do next is to show you why the number of registers is really kind of, it, it's locked down by several constraints. Okay, but that, that was a good question. Go ahead. So is cache like, um, about the like actual, uh, is cache kind of like your schedule kind of? Like they'll tell you what to do next? Or no. Like it, instructions? Not quite. Cache is more like a transparent mechanism where the most frequently accessed data you know, pages or memory you know, locations are stored locally. So it's kind of like your history. In a way related, but not quite like that. Okay, you know, basically, you know, the the MMU can figure out, you know, what is the frequency of accessing accessing different locations in in, in memory. So even though you have eight gigabytes or sixteen gigabytes of memory space, um, of which you know the most frequently accessed ones are probably not more than let's say three or you know three megabytes or so. So in other words, when you look at when you look at the frequency of you know how you access the pages, there are okay. So let's say this is in terms of uh, frequency, which is you know, basically uh, how how often do you access a particular page, and this is you know basically quantity of those particular pages. Okay, so there's a lot of pages where the frequency is really low. It's like you know we don't access those a lot, but they will spike you know at a certain <coughs> point where you know, the frequency is really high and you're accessing those pages a lot, okay? So it's like your, so like when it needs to go back next time, it sees that you've been going there a lot. Right. And it's, instead of going to the actual location all the time, it, it, it can go to cache, like, oh, it, it's in room 10. Right. Room just goes in right away. It is transparent to the processor, which means it's also transparent to instructions of the processor. So just re remember the analogy that I, I was using a little bit earlier. So I'm the processor. I'm the actual core of a processor, not the die of the processor, but the actual core part of the processor. So the processor says, you know, okay, I need to access page 29 of the textbook of this class, okay? And the MMU, which is external to the processor, is the one that will keep an eye on how I access memory locations, and it will figure out that and say, hey, you have been asking for this page like 20 times in the same class already. So why don't I just lo keep a local copy so I don't have to run to the library 20 times per class. I just run to the library once at the beginning of the class, and now I just keep a local copy and just say, Jack, every time you ask for that page, instead of going to the library, I have a local copy, here you are. So that's the function of the MMU. So when you look at the picture in terms of you know, the schematic picture, let's say this is a core of a processor. The MMU is sitting external to the core. They communicate. The core basically says, okay, I need the, uh, the content of this location. That's what the core is going to ask. The MMU will figure out, so the MMU has you know, access to the cache. Now the level of the cache does not even matter in this picture because it's just explaining logically how all these components connect. And it also has access to your usual memory, which includes the ROM, which is only used for the most part when you're starting on a computer. For the most part, you only need to access RAM when you're running a program. So this picture is kind of you know, a, a pictorial representation of what I just said. The processor core will ask the MMU and say, give me the content of page blah, blah, blah. And then the MMU will say, okay, let me see if I have it cached already. If it does, then it will just feed it from the cache to the core. If it doesn't, then it will go out to the memory and optionally store that also into the cache. Okay. So, but that's all up to the MMU to decide what to cache, what not to cache. When the cache is full, filled up, 
then it has to say, okay, well, processor core, you haven't accessed this particular page for a while. Why don't I kick this one out of the cache so I can store something that is actually useful? But that's all up to the MMU to decide. The processor core does not even need to know that the MMU is sitting between the core and the memory. So it's transparent. So the core is at the box, and then like it tells the MMU, which is the type of A, I need this done, and then it just goes out and sort it kind of, of delegates what you yeah. yeah, sort of, you know, because the, the processor can't communicate you know, with a lesser processor, there's no cache. If without cache, there's no MMU, the processor can't communicate directly to memory. So it's, tra it's transparent. The, the, the existence of the MMU is, is for the most part transparent to the processor core. Yep. The idea being that your MMU guy in the back of the classroom, he's basically invisible to you. So a piece of Correct. paper will float through the classroom to you. Exactly. Where he gets it, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Now the processor core, inside the processor core, I've got a right core on the outside because I'm going to show you what is inside the processor core. So inside the processor core, we typically draw an ALU like this, you know, like a little funnel with both with two inputs, because that's how you do most calculations. You need two numbers as input and one number as the output. And then in here, we also have the registers. So registers by location is completely different. It's at a different place compared to cache and also memory. This is close, really close to the ALU. You can see that cache is fast but it's not nearly as close to the processor core, I mean to the ALU, as the registers. The registers are right next to the ALU. Or like the RAM has to travel all that distance. Oh yeah, yeah. this is not even to scale. This distance is really, 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 really long in terms of how much time it takes for something here to get back to the processor core. This is a long path right here, okay? This is a shorter path, but nonetheless, there is still a certain distance. This is like right next to it, like bam, you, you get it. Like in your pocket, you just pull it out. Yeah, exactly, instead of at the end of the classroom. Yeah. So are there any questions about this particular picture? It's pretty much universal to most processor design you know, today, so it doesn't, whether, it doesn't matter whether this is an i7 processor that you have in your laptop computer, or whether it's the, um, um, uh, the ARM processor in your phone, it's the base, the basic scheme is the same. Okay, the scale can be different. You know, some can have a lot more cache, other can, the other ones can have less cache. So the next question is, okay, how does the number of registers impact instruction sets? Okay. So we'll take a look at one particular instruction set, which is 8086. That's kind of like the granddaddy of your I series uh, processors. So instruction set. And I'll just took it, take a look at one particular instruction, which is re relevant to what we are doing right now, okay? The add instruction itself. And this is the instruction set. It's a pretty long document. I'm not going to read the entire document. All I want is to go to the add instruction. Okay, where's the add instruction here? Okay, it doesn't show the... Yeah, I know, but I, I'm looking for the actual bit pattern of the instruction. So let me see if I can find it here. Register, okay, there we go. But it doesn't, it doesn't show me the actual binary code, so this is not going to be helpful. Okay, so opcodes, there we go. Okay, instruction map. Okay, this is the add instruction. There are several add instructions because we want the one that has register and register. And I need to find out what these mean. Okay, what about, what is E? Okay, E is Register field selects a general register. So we want a G. Okay. Well, this is. I think. I think we we are talking about this already. So these are the individual registers. But this is not the same instruction set that we use in this class. But it's close. Okay. So you can basically see that in this case, I think. It goes from the row and then the column. So the instruction to specify add, to add two numbers, 
with AL as one particular register to supply the values and also store the value, and then the other one is IB. Okay, let me see. I think I is immediate, which is basically a constant, but this is a fixed code. In other words, when the processor encounters the bit pattern 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 as a byte, that specific bit pattern specifies the instruction. We say, okay, let's go ahead and perform an add operation. What are we adding? We're adding the content of a register, AL, we'll talk about the AL register at some point, and also the immediate constant that is next to the instruction itself. But this one is fixed, okay? So each one of these instructions, okay, if you look at the add instruction here, this is two zero as an instruction, two zero as uh, hexadecimal units, hexadecimal digits. So the instruction in terms of bit pattern is zero zero one zero for the two and zero 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 for the zero here. That specific eight bit bit pattern specifies, oh, let's go ahead and perform a bit wise and operation. Uh, what two things are we adding? We're adding between this thing here and this thing here. So what is EB and what is GB? Well, if you take a, if you click it, it will tell you what is E. We saw that earlier. So E is um, a byte following the opcode that specifies the operand. The operand is either a register or memory location or memory address. So basically, it is a place where the number is stored. And then GB is a general purpose register. So it specifies a register. Now, if you use GB, then we have an issue because how many bits do we need to specify a register? Depends on how many registers you have in this architecture. Does that make any sense? Okay. So if I have eight general purpose registers, then the instruction itself will reserve three bits to specify which one <coughs> out of the eight registers that I want to specify as the second argument to this end. Does that make any sense? So this is for a really, really old architecture. You know, the 8086 is relatively old by today's standard. But how does that relate to your i7 processor? Same instructions. Fortunately, no. it's the same instructions. Say again? Potentially, unfortunately, it hasn't changed. Yes, the, your i7 has backward compatibility to this particular instruction set. So there is a problem here. Okay? So, so the problem is not the transistors are not small enough that we can pack more, resist, uh, pack more registers into the processor. The problem is we want to maintain backward compatibility. So we cannot change the instruction set. And if you cannot change the instruction set, if the old instruction set can only deal with eight general purpose registers, then your new architecture with all the you know, cool new features and whatnot and tiny little transistors will still have to play by those rules of only having eight general purpose registers. Is that, is that okay so far? So the next question is, why do we need backward you know, compatibility? Why do we need the i7 processor today to be able to execute 8086 instructions? It, 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 it's because of a company that swaps oh, sharpen the M. Yes, it's not, it's not Macromedia. <laughs> okay, but why, why do you think it is important to Microsoft to maintain this kind of backward compatibility? Go ahead. People will buy a server software, let's say uh, Microsoft Service 3000, and they need to have the ability to run Windows NT well, but in that case, I'll give you a, you know, you know, a, an argument, okay? So if you use, if you go to Debian.org and see if, uh, let me see what kind of, where did they say the, the kind of architecture it supports? Well, I can just look up any package and find out, okay? So I'm looking for a Linux image, okay, so uh, that will do it. Over here. There we go. And we are looking at Linux space using the stable distribution. And then we want to take a look at what kind of architecture it supports. It says all. Okay, that's not helpful. <laughs> I need to find something that is specific to each. Okay, this would okay, limit to our architecture. So this is the list of architectures that are currently supported by Debian. Wow. 
So of these, you can say several are closely related, and you just call that a family. Okay, that's fine. I can I can understand that. Um, the alpha architecture is on its own. The AMD 64, you can kind of say it's about the same as the i386, which is about the same as, no, these two are the ones, okay? So these two are related, and they have a whole bunch of ARM architectures that are also closely related. But even if you group things you know, into groups, and say, okay, this is one group, this is one group, this is one group, we still have a lot of groups here, okay? Because the alpha architecture is on its own, the x86 architecture is the AMD64, which is using the AMD64 bit instruction set, which is an extension on top of the uh, i386 instruction set, which is all the way over here. i 86 IA64 is Intel's own 64-bit instruction set, which is not used very often anymore, okay? Because we are all, even the Intel processors today, make use of the AMD64 bit instruction set. Of course, Intel would not like to admit that, but it is the case. <laughs> Why do we get rid of it? Hmm? Why do we just get rid of it? Get rid of the i864? Because there are older servers that are still running processors using Intel's own 64-bit architecture. Yep. Which one is the best? In terms of the instruction set itself, the AMD 64-bit instruction set is superior to the i864 instruction set. It's just, you know, better arranged. Is it better than all of them? No. Well, it all depends on the underlying architecture. But the, but the point is, you have a bunch of ARMs here. So you have ARM64, six, ARM ARMEL, ARMHL. Okay. So let's say all of these is one you know, single architecture. The ADR is another architecture that is not related to anything else on this list. <coughs> um, I386 is one. We'll call these three the same architecture. Okay, the same family. And then we have the K3 BSD, but they are still about the same. In terms of architecture, it's the same as the other part that makes a difference. Uh, the Motorola 68000 is its own architecture. It's not related to anything else on this list. Um, MIPS is own, has its own family. So one, two, three, you know, those are the MIPS family. The PowerPC has its own you know, unique architecture, so that's another architecture. Family. So the PowerPC, PowerPC SPC, PowerPC 64, PowerPC 64E, that's its own family. S390, those are mainframes of IBM mainframes from the really old days. Okay, I really don't think people use the part very much, but it's an architecture on its own. SH4 is a Hitachi you know, architecture that is also not used very often, but it is its own architecture. And then the Sparks are their own architecture as well. So we, even if you count families, we're still counting, what, seven families or something like that? And yet you can say, okay, I want to install Linux. Well, you can install Linux on just about anything. So why do you think, in the case of Microsoft, that they insist that Intel preserves the backward compatibility? So you first, and then you. Uh, their system quality just make use of one they start making processors that don't run that architecture that is compatible with Windows, then they're pretty much done. Because then someone else will come in and say, okay, well, I, I make something that's just good in Windows, but it can do it with different architectures. And then they're going to have competition, and that's what they don't want. Okay. Maybe so the developers that made a program back in like you know, Windows 98, they still have to Okay, I, I, I can tell you the pain of upgrading Windows, and then that will help me to explain you know, what you just said, okay? Right. So when you upgrade Windows, let's say you upgrade from Windows 7 to 10, okay? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah and I typically did. what you right. experience, especially if you have older hardware, like scanners, printers, and whatnot, so um, the drivers. new operating system would not have the drivers for the obsolete older hardware anymore. So even if your hardware is still taking, is still running, but if it's not being sold at this point, it's not on the market, it's not going to be supported. Every time you upgrade Windows, the drivers are not backward compatible, or I should not say they're not forward compatible. So the driver that you have for your old scanner when you use your Windows XP will not be usable anymore when you upgrade to Windows 10. Even though the scanner is still running, 
even though you, you cannot buy anymore, but it's still running. But you cannot use the same driver that you had for XP and make it run in Windows 10. Yeah, yeah but Win32 EXCF server, that was kind of like, right? Some stuff is backward compatible, but not everything. Yep, and sometimes you get like a driver that kind of it does the job. <coughs> Yeah. Like, you ever like uh, upgrade and then like your video card doesn't work yeah. exactly right? Yeah. It's like the same kind of. But can you just update your driver? Sorry? Can you just update your driver? If there's, a, if there's an update available? Yeah, but sometimes yeah. the update is not available because when you look at HP, HP says, you know, this scanner is really old, it uses GUSI instead of, you know, USB or sure. you know, parallel port. So HP is not going to go back and rewrite the driver so they can run it in Windows 10 because the the, the scanner is no longer on the market. They don't really give it anymore, right? You know, so it's like you know, why do I want to write a driver on a product that is no longer being sold? You know, um, but in Linux, you know, you can find drivers all the way back to like really old, old, old type of hardware because the driver architecture has not changed. You just recompile. Okay, right. which brings us to the next really important topic. Okay, is what 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 is what is involved if you just say that okay I'm coming up with my own super duper 64 bit architecture. Okay, on paper it's really good. You know it's it's very uh, power you know, power conserving. It has a lot of processing power. It is optimized to run you know modern day you know programs and whatnot. What do you need to do to port an operating system? to the new architecture? What, what is involved in the process? So they have to change their system. They have to change something, right? But yeah. what, what is involved? Okay, so. Oh, that's gonna be a lot of money, a lot of work. No. Okay, so let, let's see what, what, what um, needs to be changed. And for one, they're probably going to either probably going to write a C compiler to target. Okay, a C compiler. But you have to write the entire new C compiler. The, 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 the code generator. Is the back end, right? Just the back end. In other words, if you want, okay, go ahead. You need to add support to the Linux kernel. You need to add support to the kernel, okay, so. Okay, but this is the, this is the majority of the work, okay? So whenever <coughs> time you have a new architecture, you have to look into GCC and then say, okay, what do I need to change in GCC so it will crank out object code for this new architecture? compared to the other architectures. As it turns out, C, uh, GCC as a C compiler is extremely modular. In other words, you, can, you basically get to keep the majority of the code of GCC. All you have to do is to change the very back end of it so that you know, when it goes from intermediate representation, which is kind of like assembly but not assembly, into actual assembly code, that's the part that you need, need, that you need to modify, which is just the back end, okay? It's some amount of work, but it's not like totally undoable, okay? Um, you have to make changes to the kernel because the deepest part of the kernel is definitely architecture dependent. So this part here, you have to use assembly language to rewrite that part <coughs> of the kernel. And then you can look up you know, the percentage of assembly code in a Linux kernel. In fact, you, know, you can just look it up now, okay? So you just look up percentage assembly code Linux kernel, and I would not be surprised if there's a number here somewhere, okay. Oh, okay, that would be helpful too. 1.8%, so let's call it 2%, okay. So of the entire Linux kernel, which is really big, a lot of source code, only 2% is written in assembly code, and that part is certainly architecture dependent. So when you change the architecture, you'll have to change that part. Yep. Yeah, so if you don't mind, can you uh, tell me what kernel is? Like, I have an idea, but I don't know. Okay, so, um, so a kernel, when you look at an operating system, what, what is an operating system? Now, this is not a topic that is just kind of um, unrelated to this class, because at some point, we will talk about how your program, your application program, actually talks to the operating system. So it's a really relevant topic. Okay, what is, a, what is an operating system? What to you, what is an operating system? Whether it's Windows or, or Linux or whatnot. What is an operating system? What, what does it do? It's the software that makes the whole thing go. Okay. It just makes the computer useful to you. 
makes the computer useful to you as an end user. Yeah. Yep. I've heard like a car analogy. In a car, the driver just needs to know the basics, mm -hmm. while everything else is being done behind the scenes in the engine. Okay. So it, it makes it uh, user friendly. Okay. So I'll draw a picture that has you know the extreme ends of you know what the computer is and and how it's used. Okay. So on one end we have the end user, which is you, right, and I, okay? So we are the end users. And then on the very end, you have the actual hardware, which is stuff you know, that you put in your pocket, in your backpack, you know, on your desktop, and stuff like that. Is that okay so far? Okay, so somehow the end user has to be able to utilize the hardware to do useful stuff, instead of just turning, a, turning on your PC and say, oh, I, I have a heater here. <laughs> Which I can probably say about most of your gaming PCs. Right? You turn it on, it's automatically a heater. If you want to crank up the heat, just run some you know, benchmark program on it. <laughs> it's a good space heater too, considering how many fans you have on those things. <laughs> it helps to circulate air in the, in the room and keep every single corner of your room warm. <laughs> okay? Well, I mean, how many people have a one kilowatt power supply on your gaming PC? Okay, we got one, and a few other people who are just kind of like, well, I'm not going to admit to it. <laughs> okay, one kilowatt is a lot of power. Okay, your hair dryer is only 1,800 you know, watts. So two of these computers is a hair dryer already. Then you go like, well, okay, so even the computer cannot beat a hair dryer. How long do you run your hair dryer each day? Okay, so even if it have relatively long hair, I would say no more than, what, 15 minutes, right? How long do you run your PCs? Oh. Well, there goes your energy, right? There goes your bill. Okay, so now we have the end user, we have the hardware, okay? The operating system, okay, let's start from this end here. What do you use, how do you make use of your computer? Just not only for this class, but for programming classes, application programs. Yes. Input devices. Input devices, yeah. but but the way you use it is, you don't think about the input devices so much. You think about the applications. You want your computer to do word processing. You want to browse the web. You want to check your grade. You want to do your homework. Blah blah blah. So the first layer is your application programs, and then your application program needs to talk to something else, right? Because you don't want your application program like Word or LibreOffice to directly access your hard drive on a sector by sector basis. That may not be a very good idea. So when you are ready to save a file, what do you do? What do you think your application program does when it's, when you say, okay, save, control S? It asks if there's space available. Well, it says oh, it's to so the operating system. It talks to the operating system, very good. So your operating system sits one level below your app, okay, by offering these services, okay? So your app is talking to your operating system and say, hey, you know, operating system, I would like to open a file for writing with this name in this folder. The operating system can come back and say, nope, can't do that because that folder is protected. But for the most part, if it is in your own your home folder, the operating system goes like, okay, sure, this is the file handle, do whatever you need to do with this file handle. Okay, and then you go ahead, the application program will now take the file handle, which is just a number, to identify a file and say, okay, I'm gonna write this content into the file and then close it. Okay? But your application program is not directly accessing the hardware. It's not directly accessing your SSD because that would not be a very good idea. Does that make, make any sense? Okay. So the operating system is actually a pretty big chunk of software. Okay. So when, when you look at the operating system, the top layer is what we call, you can call this an API, application programming interface. So this is a published interface to interact with application programs. So regardless of whether you're using Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Internet Explorer, Firefox, or what, you know, Winscape, um, QEMU for this class, and so on and so forth, it's still going through the same API to talk to those various applications. Go ahead. So when we put the drivers in the system? The driver will be down here somewhere. Okay, so the driver is pretty much at the other end of the stack of the operating system because the drivers are the ones that are pretty much directly talking to the hardware. 
In other words, your um, your uh, SATA driver, okay, depending on the chipset, can actually directly talk to the chipset itself, which in return they'll talk to your hard drives and your actual SSDs and whatnot. Are we gonna know how to like write our own drivers? Sorry. Are we gonna know how to write our own drivers? No, not not in this class. <clears throat> we don't really get to play with hardware much in this class, just because of the way. The way it has to be structured, you know, means that we don't have enough time to kind of play with this stuff a lot. Um, okay, so there's the API, which is an application program interface. There's the driver, and then the kernel. Oh, there's one more thing here. Okay, so the API is one. There's also something called a shell. Okay, in Windows, the shell is known as CMD, the command line interface called CMD. Um, in Linux, is you most Linux machines use Bash which is a born again <coughs> shell, okay? But some people also use C shell, as in C, the letter C shell. Um, but most people use bash, okay, the born again shell. So the shell basically talks through a dumb terminal, but it, it's just serial. So a shell is kind of interesting because all it needs is some kind of a serial link to a teletype, what we call a teletype terminal. So it can interact with a typewriter if you want to, through RS-232. Of course, none of you remember or know what is, <laughs> is RS-232 because this is a standard of communication that is kind of really old. Okay, but that's the good old days, you know, people use RS-232 between a mainframe and a typewriter. <laughs> so that's how you interact with a computer. You use a typewriter. And that's how the computer communicates with you is, you know, it would type on a typewriter on a piece of paper <laughs> instead, of a dump, instead of a CRT terminal. CRT comes much later compared to uh, teletype, which is a typewriter, okay? So that's why, you know, it's being, being able to talk in a serial way is really useful because all you need is just one serial communication way of communication. Now, these days, we don't use RS-232 anymore, but dumb terminals are still used a lot, okay? And sometimes we use that to communicate through Bluetooth. You can open a dumb terminal to a Bluetooth device and actually hand type commands to a Bluetooth GPS. You can type up your know, commands to your Lego Mindstorms, you know, a processor. You can interact with your Bluetooth devices for the most part using a dump terminal. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so inside here is the actual kernel. Okay, so the kernel is kind of like a really deep part of your operating system. It does not interact directly with the end user through a shell, does not interact directly with applications through the API. It does interact with a driver, okay? So the kernel is really the core part. This is also the part where the virtual memory is implemented. And this is also the part where most of the security stuff is really important because it has to make sure that your programs cannot, talk, cannot see the memory space of each other and stuff like that. So when we talk about the kernel, we are basically talking about the part of your operating system that does not interact directly with the end user or the application or the screen. The GUI, on the other hand, is kind of an interesting odd part. The GUI is not really here anywhere. In other words, the graphical user interface is usually not considered a part of an operating system unless you talk to Microsoft. <laughs> and Microsoft says, yes, it is an integral part of the operating system. Microsoft wants you to believe that Internet Explorer, now called Edge, is a part of the operating system. It's not. <clears throat> it's an application program that, you, that, there should be, that should be optional. Okay, so where does the GUI fit into this big picture? I mean, we are using a GUI, GUI right now. So Isn't there something that kind of interacts with the shell? Mm, not exactly. Like a yeah. It's a well, okay. So in the case of X Windows, which is what you see, uh, X Window, not not Pro. X Window is is the GUI environment in most Linux type systems. It is entirely different. It is sitting in its own, in its own box. This is X Window, and X Window talks to the operating system core through guess what, the API. So X-Window is simply an application, just one that we don't have any control over? Well, in a way it is an application, in a way it is not. So it's kind of odd because there are two parts to X-Window. One part of X-Window talks through here, through sockets. 
So I'm not going to talk about sockets in this class, but you can basically look at a socket as a uh, internet connection. Okay, just look at it as an internet connection. It's serial, it's TCP, TCP IP. Okay, the other part of X window is down here. So there's a driver down here to talk to your video card. That is a part of X window as well. So when you install X windows, X window, excuse me, when you install X window, there's a part that is here. This part is called the server of X window. This is called the client of X window. So X window gets its information from the processor through the API and then creates a display which sends to the driver then to the hardware. Right. Okay. And then but how does your how does you know Firefox make you make use of X window to, to display stuff? So Firefox is out here, okay? So Firefox interacts directly with X window and this connection here can be remote. Okay. In other words, I can have I can run Firefox on an entire an, an, a different machine and have it display locally. So this link here is kind of interesting because this side is local to the part of the machine that is actually owning the display. But Firefox as an application can be running on a power server right now and only have the display displayed locally. Yep. Is that why uh, the X window uses sockets instead of? Yes. OK, that, that kind of makes sense then. Yeah, actually I should say the, the socket is this part here. It makes use of socket to communicate with the window driver, which then talks through the kernel, talk to the driver, and then talk to the video card. Interesting. Yeah, and that's also why you know it's, it's really cool, because if you have any type of uh, program that, takes, that needs a lot of processing power, then you can run the application remotely on a server farm, Okay, not even a server, you, you have a farm to run your application to give you all the processing power that you need. But you can have your local machine fairly weak just to display the visualization part of the app. Interesting. That's a very interesting, you know. Um, is that basically what a Chromebook does? Chromebook is kind of using this model, but it's using Firefox, using a browser. Yeah. But it is the same idea of your, of your Firefox being just a dumb terminal interacting with a remote server that is potentially a lot more powerful. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, so you said, sorry, you said uh, kernel just takes care of the uh, security kind of thing? A lot of security features have to be implemented at a kernel right. level because you have to make sure that your application programs cannot get out of quote unquote the sandbox that it's given. Mm -hmm. okay. So is the kernel like the, <coughs> like, like the teacher? The kernel is, is the one thing that ties everything together. So the kernel does not even include file systems. Okay, file systems are external to the kernel. So if you want to use extension four, which is what we use in the virtual machine, that's a file system. Okay, if you want to use NTFS, okay, NTFS. If you want to use, you know, FAT32, these are these are modules that are a part of the operating system, but they are not a part of the kernel. So it is more of a modular design. So in case you need it, you can install additional modules. But if you don't need it, you can make your kernel smaller by not including you know some of these modules, because you know some of the, the file systems are not used very often, at least in Linux. So you can basically leave those uninstalled or at least not loaded, so they don't take up any memory space while you have your operating system up and running. So if you take, say, um, like TFS, you know, I'm not gonna use that, for example. If you take that out, then is that gonna make the kernel run smoother? Well, the kernel becomes smaller, it becomes more modular. Okay. And, yep, go ahead. So the kernel is the middleman? The kernel is the coordinating part of your entire mm -hmm. software stack. Mm -hmm. So it's at the very deepest part because it, it has to coordinate many, many different things. Yep. So does uh, memory management? Memory management is a part of the kernel, yep. Because it doesn't go any lower level. Yep, go ahead. Uh, why do sometimes kernel panic? Like, uh, why does that happen? Kernel panic is basically the kernel itself crashing. So it can have different types of stuff crashing. 
can have your application crashing, which gives you a you know, segmentation fault. It displays something on the screen and go like, okay, this program is no longer working. Okay, but that's fully recoverable because the kernel itself is fine. The kernel is still able to kill the process, recover all the resources, and reallocate it to something else. So in the case of an application crashing, it's no big deal. When the kernel itself crashes, then you have no, no, there's no place to back up to, there's no, no place to fall back on when the kernel crashes. So kernel panic is really bad because you know, it, it just freezes, the whole system just freezes. If you're lucky, you get a kernel panic and it shows you some you know, stack trace and basically just to say, okay, this is the last thing that was done to, leading to the crash. Right? But sometimes you don't even get to see that. Okay? You know, everything, everything just freezes and you don't see anything. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, why, back to your earlier question, why does Microsoft insist that, we, that Intel makes the processors backwards? That's a very good question, isn't it? So, we'll get back to that one. Yep, go ahead. So, is that when blue screens of death happen? Blue screen of death is the kernel itself dying. Yes. So, in, in Windows land, it is the kernel dying. Then it will give you the blue screen of death. And that is kind of interesting too, because if the kernel itself has just died, how can it run the code to give you the blue screen of death, right? Well, there's an alarm called a watchdog timer. Okay, the watchdog timer is a very interesting mechanism where um, it's basically a timer, okay? But this is one of those things where it is a fail-safe you know, kind of feature. So as a watchdog timer, um, you can, it's usually programmable, okay? So let's say it's programmed to half a second, 500 milliseconds. So you have a 500 millisecond watchdog timer. What it means is every, um, if you don't quote unquote hit it in software, you know, every 500 milliseconds, then the watchdog timer is gonna go off. And when, when it does go off, then it will trigger an NMI. Okay, I'll explain what that is, okay? It will trigger an NMI, which leads to the display of the blue screen of death. So under normal situations, the operating system will could quote unquote hit the watchdog um, every 200 milliseconds or so, but at least it will keep the watchdog from going off. Oh, Is that okay so far? Okay, so the NMI is called a non-maskable interrupt, which basically means you know there's no way to stop the NMI from interrupting the processor. Okay, hey processor, you have to do this now. Okay, so when the NMI occurs because the watchdog has just timed out, the, the operating system has no way to resist that and say, oh, I'm doing something else. No, you have to run the interrupt surface routine, ISR, corresponding to the NMI, and that is what displays the, uh, the kernel panic screen of Linux or the blue screen of death in Windows. So there's a mechanism inside every single PC called the watchdog timer that gives you this capability to at least be able to trace back a little bit of what caused the really hard crash. So like, is it like it's last breath pretty much? No. Kind of like that, you know, the watchdog timer is really kind of like a fail safe feature exactly for, for this type of situation because otherwise you cannot debug um, issues leading to kernel panic. So like, what's the best way to crash a kernel? I have to the best way to crash a kernel, the best way to crash the kernel is to install, uh, you know, uh, suspicious uh, drivers. <laughs> because suspicious drivers actually run at the same level as the kernel, but if they are not written in a good way, then you know, it's, chances are they can crash the kernel. So when 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 bad driver code runs, you know, you you, you basically take out down the entire system. When you run bad applications, it just takes out the application itself. It doesn't really do a whole lot of damage. Yep. If you try to install an XP driver on Windows 7 and then try to use that driver, might it crash the system? It may not let you install it, probably tell you because the driver, the driver you know, self-identifies which operating system yeah. is for. So when you try to install the driver from XP, you know, XP driver and you try to install it in Windows 7, that should not cause any harm because Windows 7 would just say, okay, this is this driver is not compatible with this operating system. Do driver viruses act like drivers? Huh? Viruses act like drivers, is that how they actually do their damage? You can potentially have, you know, virus code that is embedded into a driver. Yes, you know, that can happen. So what about ones that are in applications? Do they, I mean, like, 
So their purpose is to get to the kernel, but if the application that's off the hook is the kernel, then the only thing it does to the driver, do they like go through the driver route? Well, depending on what kind of driver you're talking about, if you have a virus or malicious software in a driver, that can do a lot of you know, bad stuff. Especially when you're talking about a driver that talks to your SATA controller, because it has access to your hard drive. And guess where your passwords and whatnot are stored. Yep. I think he's asking, how does a, a virus embedded in an application uh, make its way control of the kernel? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> you run in a Windows, in a the home edition of Windows. That's all you need. <laughs> because when you run a home edition of Windows, as far as I know, you know the default user runs as administrator, right. which means you know you have right access to just about everything as a regular end user. But Windows doesn't tell you that. Right? I mean, it doesn't say that, hey, so you are given this you know, super then. duper power, please use it wisely. <laughs> or, you know, in the home edition, it doesn't even tell you that you should set up a separate account with limited administrative access. So that's why, like, the newer, like, uh, Windows 10 and stuff like that, like, you keep all in, not admin, you have to do what you have to be to get admin access. Do they do that with the home edition, too? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have it on this, and I have to, like, I'd go through hell to get administrative access to my laptop. But that's for your, but that means you know your if your end user account gets hacked, hopefully it cannot overwrite system files where you know your infection can go all the way down here. <laughs> okay, so getting back to that question, okay, getting back to your question of you know, why is this a big deal to Microsoft when you can see so many variants of Linux on different architectures. Now, true story, some university came up with a you know, hypothetical architecture because universities like to do research, so they want to try out different ways to, of pipelining, caching, you know, doing parallel processing, you know, different ways to arrange the ALUs, predictive execution, and stuff like that. Okay? So it's not you know, unconceivable that they might come up with an architecture and just want to try out. But how do you try out new architecture in a real way? Well, the best way is to you know, port Linux to the new architecture, and then you run all the usual software you know, on that new architecture and see how it performs. Does that make sense? Okay. And so graduate students can typically you know, port an operating system or port a new architecture to Linux within a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so we're talking about maybe one or two man year, maybe two, two man years, okay? Let's, let's call it two man years. And a lot of times, you know, they can get Linux to run on a virtualized platform before the processor is fab, fabricated. Okay? In other words, they are running the processor itself in simulation, and yet they can run Linux on it already without the actual hardware chip. Hmm. And that kind of tells you, you know, how hard it is to port an architecture to a particular operating system, to make a port of it. So I can, only per, I can only guess that in Microsoft's case, they did not write the code in a modular way. So porting the operating system to a different architecture involves a lot more work than you know, porting Linux. So they almost have to rewrite the entire system. Sorry? But they almost like, have to rewrite the entire They probably have to rewrite a very significant portion, and that's why it is difficult for Microsoft to port their operating system onto a different architecture. Yep. So I'm pretty much was right. Yes, and they could have used that money to change the way the GUI works to convince people to upgrade to the next version of Windows, which generates revenue. As opposed to porting to a different architecture, it does not directly generate revenue, right? right. And also because uh, Microsoft is not open sourced, so you cannot, you know, just say, just say, okay, here's an operating system, it's already running on these architectures, but if you want to play with it, go ahead and modify it and port it to a, whatever architecture you can dream of, right? So you cannot, you know, you cannot leverage, you know, all these you know, graduate students and all the researchers, you know, who will basically say, okay, you know, my job is to do research, my job is to come up with the next architecture, but I want to be able to run it on an existing operating system and I'll just use my time to port it. Microsoft cannot leverage that kind of resources because every single time it, it needs to do some work, it has to be done by either employees or contractors. So that's why with Linux, there's so much architecture. 
Like yes, that that would be one of the factors that makes you know, Linux so uh, yeah, prolific. Basically, yeah. it's available on all different types of architectures. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a side question. If you go back to the chart, you were just uh, okay. Um, this chart here. Jump in two thousand five. What happened there? Um, that's the time when um, I think a lot of big companies, you know, started to use Linux for their servers. So at this point, I know IBM makes use of Linux on their servers. Um, HP makes use of Linux on their servers. Um, so I think that's about the time when you know uh, IBM and HP jumped onto the jumped onto the bandwagon of open source. IBM used to have its own Unix operating system called AIX, and HP has its own had its own had its, had its own Unix operating system called HP UX. And both companies realize that they have to spend a lot of time to maintain their own server operating systems. And they decided, hey, you know, if Linux is already out there, we can just leverage you know, the resources of the open source community. Now, in the case of IBM, it's kind of interesting because most people think of IBM as a huge, gigantic bully when it comes to the computer industry, which it probably was. Okay? Mm -hmm. But they also made a lot of contributions to Linux. You know, they made a lot of code open sourced so that you know, everybody can use that in any Linux environment. So that's a kind of like a culture shift to IBM. It's, not probably be, it's probably not because IBM thought that uh, we want to benefit in the entire world, but they think this is actually beneficial you know, money-wise. You know, if they open source like a driver for a new, new file system, it makes it possible for other people to play with it for one thing, find problems with it, and potentially even fix it. So they're not losing, because IBM is not in the business of selling operating systems. It's, this is the biggest difference between IBM and Microsoft. How does IBM make money? Hardware. Hmm? No, not even hardware. Service, service, okay? It's like a mafia. They take care of business. <laughs> they don't sell bullets, they don't sell guns. They sell service. Okay, you got something to take care of? We'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you say servers or service? Service. Service? Service. service. IBM sells service, okay? You want something and they go, go, exactly. So, okay, so for instance, okay, let's say I'm Wells Fargo Bank and I'm dealing with um, an IT system, okay? I want to re-implement everything in a secure way, okay? So what you can do, as far as Wells Fargo is concerned, is to have your own people to specify a server, operating systems, database, application software, and, and the whole enchilada. Or you can contact IBM and say, I want a solution. They don't call it a service, they call it a solution. So IBM sells you a solution and they, they ask you, okay, what do you need? We need this, that, and whatnot. I need you know, these, you know, perform, this kind of performance, and so on and so forth. IBM just makes it happen. <laughs> with, a, well, with a fee, of course, right? <laughs> But that's what they're selling, okay? So they sell you service, they sell you a solution that is already done, okay? What does Microsoft sell? Operating systems. Licenses. Licenses. Licenses, problems. Licenses. 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 okay? <laughs> Good problem. <laughs> Microsoft sells licenses, which is completely different from the, the business model of selling a solution and the service, okay? So IBM basically says, okay, we'll charge you X amount of money each year but if anything happens, we are on it. Okay, we'll take care of it. Microsoft says, if you pay us $99, I'll give you the permission to install this program for this duration with these limitations. If it doesn't work, hey, you know, it's not our problem. Not our problem. <laughs> okay, you know, we'll give you a, we'll, we'll give you a website to report your problem, but don't call us. <laughs> So, so it's a completely different business model. To, for Microsoft to continue their revenue stream, what do they have to do? Sell so Xboxes. <laughs> so for Xboxes, which, they, which is a really bad business because Xboxes is in competition with a lot of other you know, game boxes. So the hardware itself, I don't think they make much money out of it. But they get the licensing off of that. They have, once again, we boil down to, it boils down to yeah. licensing again, right? <laughs> yes, it's all about licensing. So for, for Microsoft to generate a revenue, it is about licensing. But for IBM, it is about selling the service, okay? We just charge you X amount of money per year, 
And to Mike, to, to Wells Fargo, you know, the, I, I'm not sure how much, okay, let's say $6 million a year, okay? But $6 million a year is a predictable amount, okay? I can factor that in into my budget and say $6 million bucks, okay, I'll goes to IT, it, okay? And then you don't have to you know, deal with, okay, you know, all the additional issues because you know, it, it's taken care of. As opposed to finding things, you know, you know, piecemeal and try to put everything together to get it to work. If it doesn't work, you know, if, think about Wells Fargo Bank's you know, computer system. If it stops working for a day, mm. how much money is Wells Fargo going to lose because the because the, I, the information system fails for one day? Billions. Oh, Probably wow. a lot of money, right? More than $6 million. More oh, yeah. than what is paying IBM to provide that solution. Yeah? Okay. Um, so I I remember remember for like two years, years. Yeah. and we had it. Yeah. Like yeah. Okay, so yeah. we're digressing a little bit more, but it's still it's, kind of relevant it's, to it's the like discussion hell. because it's still relevant to the discussion of operating systems. Okay, <clears throat> so we'll take a look at the uh, history of the Microsoft operating system. Okay, okay, where where do we start with this you know, long history chart here? What is the first operating system that was made available? through Microsoft as a company? DOS. Yes. MS-DOS, which is really PR-DOS. Yes, so MS-DOS, and then this is the this is the line where Microsoft will start to own that. What, what is the name of that before? VR-DOS. VR-DOS? No, I thought it was QDOS. No? QDOS. No, well, okay, before that, the CPM. CPM. It's CPM, but it's not even CPM, okay? So this CPM, which stands for Control Program Slash Master, okay? that's really odd name for an operating system, but CPM was around for a long time, since the Apple II days and before the TRS-80 the runs uh, the CPM. So CPM has a clone, I cannot remember the name of the clone, CPM clone. So somebody wrote a clone of CPM, and Microsoft or Bill Gates you know, approached that person and go like, would you like to sell me your operating system? Well, okay, I, we have to go back a little more. Bill Gates went to the author, the guy who wrote CPM to begin with, the, the original CPM. The guy was out golfing, and the wife said, told, told, told Bill Gates to go away. It's like, go away. So, <laughs> so Bill Gates you know, said, okay, I guess I cannot buy CPM. And then he went to the next best you know, resource, which is the clone of CPM. The guy looked at the suitcase of $50,000 and go like, yeah, I'll take that, thank you. <laughs> so, I, so, so Microsoft bought the clone of CPM, made some changes to it, you know, probably minor changes to make it run on the original IBM PC XT, not even XT, XT is later. So the original IBM PC, okay? So that became, you know, MS-DOS, and, um, and then, take it back, <coughs> that's PC-DOS, not MS-DOS. That was PC-DOS because it was Lice, Microsoft licensed that operating system to IBM, and IBM marketed it as PC DOS. And then Microsoft approached IBM again and say, "Hey, I would I, I would like to change the contract a little bit. Um, can I sell this operating system under my company name as well?" That became MS DOS. At the time, IBM thought, "Yeah, whatever. You know, we make the hardware. You know, it makes no sense for you guys to." Try to sell the software because we dictate the hardware, right? And then maybe a year after that, you know, PC clones started to pop up everywhere. And then Microsoft go like, "Yep, we can sell you the operating system." <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first interaction between IBM and Microsoft. So, yep, so go ahead. CPM clone was there like no copyright disputes or PC DOS? Uh, CPM clone and CPM. No, this is back in the time when you know Silicon Valley is everybody knew that stuff would be borrowed, <laughs> and they expect things to be borrowed, and they all borrow from each other, so it's no big deal. I mean, you guys are just you know guys are just used to it at the, at that time, and uh, I guess you know it's not a big industry yet, so lawyers have not really gotten the, into the whole deal just yet, so. So things, was, things, are, so things were kind of loose back in those days. Things were better. Yeah. 
So MS DOS, you know, went along, you know, and then at some point there's Windows, right? Which is which is really just a graphical user interface on top of DOS. It had no multitasking capability whatsoever. So it looks kind of nice, huh? Uh, Windows 3.1 is the first um, actual release of Windows, but there were Windows 1, Windows 2, Windows 3.0, but Windows 3.1 is the one that got popular. That's why most of us only know about 3.1 as the origin of Windows, but there were versions of Windows prior to that. And then it became, what is that about? 95, 98, 98, XP. and then 98 SE. Oh yeah, I forgot SE, second edition. Yeah, second that edition. Was the same one. That, okay, <laughs> Windows 98 SE is basically the fixed version of Windows 98. <laughs> that was the same one. <laughs> but they want you to pay extra money. If you already <laughs> bought Windows 98, Microsoft <laughs> will not give you a free upgrade to second edition. They want you to pay for Windows 98 SE, which is the second edition. Fixed version, of what they, so it's what they should have released. Yes. <laughs> so to, to everybody who bought Windows 98, Microsoft did not even say, thanks for beta testing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then, and then we went to Windows ME, okay, which is not a very good thing. Okay. So that was the, the end of the line of the DOS-based It seems like early 98. Wasn't 95 and then NT, and then NT was the backbone for 98. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so right about this time here, right about this transition time, IBM and Microsoft had another chance of a partnership. Apparently, IBM never learned those lessons. Okay? So IBM and Microsoft, you know, joined hand and go like, let's go ahead and make a new operating system, you know, that is more solid and runs on PCs really well. Okay? So that became, you know, they had two names. Okay, so this operating system that they co-developed had two names. Um, on one side, you know, Microsoft called Anti or New Technology, which I think is not a very good name <laughs> because that is new and now it is newer. So you have newer technology. I mean, yeah, it's not. And then IBM called it OS2. I guess you know it's operating systems, you know, second edition, second version. It's all new. It completely in. It, it did not share any code base with MS DOS whatsoever. The basis of NT slash OS2 is actually um, VMS, okay? So this is actually based on VMS. It's the same guy who wrote VMS for DEC, um, Digital Equipment Corporation. So that same guy who wrote, you know, who developed VMS also wrote, you know, led the team to that end up with NT on the Microsoft side and OS2 on the IBM side. And then IBM tried to market OS2 on its own PCs you know, basically just failing completely, okay? Because these two are, even though they're related, they're not 100% compatible. So, so NT basically ended up winning, and IBM basically had to toss OS2, and at some point they just said, okay, we're not gonna continue with the OS2 line of operating system because they have to spend too much money to maintain it, to keep it running, and also the applications are not crossing over either. So there's a big problem with OS2. So NT, basically became, um, the first time it became available to end users is XP. So Windows XP is the first time that the NT kernel became available on regular PCs for end users, and that became XP. And then the rest, you know, you already know, XP became um, Vista, and Vista became seven, so well, the- I thought Vista was its own thing, not based on no, Vista is basically the, uh, it's, it's XP, XP and then XP it's turned into Vista. Version. Vista turned into What's 7. But the relationship between Vista and 7 is the same thing as 98 and 98 SE. Yep. Yeah, like the whole, like, just like the, Look, seven it's is pretty much similar. Yes. It's just so much better. More it's, it's more stable. Yeah. It does not consume resources nearly as much. And once again, you know, thanks for paying for beta testing. <laughs> Same thing with 8 and 10. Same thing with 8 and 10, exactly. So then you go to 8, so and then you just skip 9, it became 10. <laughs> yep. So that's the kind of history of the Microsoft operating systems. Yep. What the history of Linux? Linux. Oh, God. That's a long history. That's an interesting one. It's both long and short. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's both long and short. You know, we might as well just spend the last five minutes to do this, right? Okay. So we look into Unix. 
and Unix was a product from the 70s, you know, early, early 70s, late 60s, okay? So the guy who wrote this was, um, what's his name? Richie. I literally started Okay, I probably will end with this particular slide here. This is uh, Dennis Ritchie, and he is one of the co-authors of the original Unix back in the 70s, okay? But this is really kind of interesting, too, because Without Unix, there won't be, there would not have been any C programming language, because this guy and his, uh, you know, <coughs> colleague, um, basically wrote the, the Unix operating system, and he was writing the operating system in assembly language code, because there was there, were, there was no C compiler for him. So it wasn't very long uh, before this guy thought, hey, this is really, you know boring because I have to write everything in assembly code. So he invented you know, the, uh, the programming language prior to C, I think it's called BCPL, okay, to basically make it easier for him to write the operating system. In other words, we are talking about a master carpenter making a new tool to make his job easier. Okay? It makes sense, okay? But that tool doesn't have a lot of safety features because he's a master gar a carpenter to begin with. It's like, I don't need a safety guard here. I don't need you know, this you know, double you know, lockout feature so that people don't cut off their finger, you know, because I know how to use the tool. So he made that tool for himself, okay? So that became Unix. And uh, Unix you know, got split into System 5 and BSD, two different distributions. BSD stands for Berkeley Standard Distribution, and then um, System 5 is the other one. So th some companies go for this one, some companies go for the other one, but they were both licensed by the Bell Lab. You know, um, at the time, AT&T Bell Lab. So it was a licensed product. So somewhere down the line, you know, Linus Torvald decided, hey, I want to play with operating systems. But since Unix is closed source, it is proprietary, so the guy said, I'm going to rewrite everything from the specification. So from the outside, it would look like it's Unix, but it really is not, okay? So he started the project you know, as Linux at the time, and not really expecting it to gain momentum in any way, he was just, it was just, pretty much out of personal curiosity. That, but then people realize, they go like, hey, you know, we can actually do stuff with this one you know, because of the licensing, because of the open source licensing. <coughs> people can actually you know, add stuff to it, make it better, and so on and so forth. And that's how it took off. Wow. Okay. So one more thing before, you know, because we still have two more minutes. This guy passed away. So when you look at the date that he died, it was 2011, October tw uh, 12th, okay? So does that range of time remind you of the death of another person? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, exactly. Oh, I'm so now we look at Jobs. We lost the great man. Steve Jobs died on the Steve Jobs. All right. Okay, so if you look at Steve Jobs, he passed away about a week prior to the demise of uh, Dennis Ritchie. Did anyone remember any news, any headline about Ritchie dying? No. There was something about him. <laughs> <laughs> there was something like a, like a sideline that's like, you know, Unix you know, Peak passed away, right? Yeah, it was like how everyone, how, it was like an article about how everyone Instead of, instead of jobs, right? Instead of the asshole named Steve. Well, because, because without Unix, there would not have been any <laughs> iOS. <laughs> yeah, that was, that, was, that was the main point. Yep, exactly. So I'm glad you actually read that article because most people would have skipped it and go like, what is this old dude? I don't even know him. Well, without him, we wouldn't have C, wouldn't have you know Unix, wouldn't have iOS. We'll still be in the dark ages of computers. We'll be still running DOS. Feels like like. Hey, I grew up on DOS. It makes me feel lazy. And I'm glad I don't have 